So good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening to all the Zoom participants and welcome to uh, Aravindai Hospital Pondicherry's uh, lockdown lecture series. Uh, so today's topic will be on aberometry in ophthalmology. So I'm, I hope that uh, all of you are able to see the screen which we shared just now and also the audio is good. Okay, so, uh, so now let us start with some goodness. So you see two plates of food here, one on the left and on the right. So what would you choose? I'm sure everyone will want to choose the one on the right for obvious reasons, because it looks tasty, it gives a lot of variety, and it has a sweet in it with a cup of coffee and so on. So what is wrong with the left one? So the left one also goes, gives enough amount of food. This might be good for a person who's hungry, but for a normal person, we will always tend to go for the one on the right. So on similar terms, patients might not be very happy with the 20 by 20 quantity. So 20 by 20 quality is what is expected out of our patients in this new era. So at one point of time, we had a lot of mature cataracts. And in those days, giving them a vision somewhere near to six by 18 also made them really happy. But now in this era of advancements, patient is expecting more from us. So when you ask a patient to read a Snellen chart with these high contrast optotypes, they might be able to read until the last line because most of the time the patient would be re reading the letters which they think they saw rather than what they're actually seeing. That is why we get to see a lot of patients who have six by six, but still complaining. So they're not very happy. So it is important for us to remember a perfect vision is far more than a Snellen's six by six. So in this era of advancements, it will be very unfair on our part to judge our patient's visual function with just the Snellen's chart. So it is important for us to move forward and examine our patient's visual fun function with the abrometers available. So this will give us a wholesome data on their visual acuity as well as their quality. So that is the aim of my presentation today. So overview, I will be dealing on some basics and some definitions. I'll be talking about abrometers, abrometry and its types, and more about applications in cataract surgery with the help of eye trace, and a little bit on applications in LASIK. So moving on to the basics, light. So rays and wave friends are two mutually complementary approaches to light propagation. So these wavefronts are always perpendicular to the rays. And one thing if you see here, the rays which are parallel to each other will always have a planar wavefront. Whereas waves which diverge or which converge will always have a spherical wavefront. So if you see here in ideal optics for light to converge to a perfect point, the wavefront that is emerging from the optical system must be a perfect sphere that is centered on the image point. So in an ideal optical system, it should follow the three rules. All rays from object point P should intersect at common point P dash on the retina in order to form a flawless point retinal image. And the optical distance from P to P dash for all the rays should be the same. And this follows the Fermat's principle. And the wave front, which is converging on the retina is always spherical. And this is called as an ideal wave front. Whereas in an aberrated optical system, all the rays from object point P do not intersect at the common point P dash. And the optical distance is also not the same for all rays 
and the waveframe converging on the retina is not spherical, so resulting in an aberrated wavefront. So this difference between an ideal wavefront and an aberrated wavefront is called the wavefront aberration. So these are some basic definitions which we need to know. So in the wave theory, all points of light that originate from the same point source and that are oscillating in the same state or phase are termed as wavefront. And wavefront aberration, as we saw earlier, it is a difference between an ideal perfect wavefront and the actual real wavefront of the eye. And this will give an idea of the total distortion in that optical system or the eye. And what is an aberrometer? A diagnostic device that measures the refractive aberrations of the eye is called the aberrometer. Now, what is asphericity or Q value? So it is nothing but a geometric measure of ellipsoid surfaces. So it represents the change in the curvature of an ellipsoid surface from the center towards the edges. So now let's take a perfect sphere. So it has equal radii in all 360 degree and has equal curvature from the center to the edges. And that is why it has an asphericity value of zero. Whereas a prolate structure is one where it has a short central radii and a longer peripheral radii. In other words, it, has, it is more curved in the center than in the periphery. So this is a prolate ellipsoid and it has a sphericity value of minus one. And what are oblate surfaces? So oblate ellipsoid surfaces are one which have a larger central radii, which means it is flat in the center and more curved in the periphery with a short radii. And oblate structures will have asphericity in the ranges of plus one. So now where does our normal cornea stand? A normal cornea is a slightly prolate structure with an average Q of minus 0.26. So now let's see about spherical aberrations. So what is a positive spherical aberration? Now in surfaces where the periphery is more curved, these peripheral rays come to a focus in a point far ahead than the central rays. And this causes a positive spherical aberration. So it is most commonly seen in oblate structures where center is less curved than the periphery. Whereas a negative spherical aberration is one where the center is curved. So it is curved more than the periphery. So the central rays come into focus in front than the marginal rays. So this is called as negative spherical aberration and this occurs in prolate structures. One more thing to remember here is more prolate structures exhibit negative spherical aberration and oblate and less prolate structures exhibit a positive spherical aberration. And that is why a natural cornea, though it is a slight prolate, it has a slight positive spherical aberration of plus 0.28 microns and a negative asphericity of minus 0.26. So all, all through our life, are we having this positive spherical aberration in our natural cornea? So how is our vision going to be? Are we always in a, a very poor visual quality? No. So a natural lens has a negative spherical aberration of minus 0.20, which will compensate for this positive spherical aberration in the cornea thereby giving us a residual spherical aberration of only 0 0.10 microns. And this helps us to have a better visual quality. But when this natural lens becomes cataractus, this negative spherical aberration becomes positive, adding on to the total positive spherical aberration, resulting in glare and halos as we age. When the lens changes come or when the cataract comes, patient commonly complains of glare and halos, especially in the night time. It is because of these higher positive spherical aberration as the lens loses its refractive index. So now, what are the other times when the cornea doesn't retain its positive spherical ablation? So in a post hyperopic ablation, the shape of the cornea is altered and it is made more prolate. So therefore, this cornea will have 
more of a negative spherical aberration than the natural cornea. Whereas on the other hand, a post myopic ablated cornea will have a flat surface in the center than the periphery. So this oblate cornea will have more positive spherical aberration than the natural cornea. So what are the symptoms of aberrations? The symptoms of aberrations are glare, starburst, halos, and ghosting. So if you see, most of the time patients will be able to see the light bulb, but the quality of vision is not good because of these higher order aberrations. What are the types of aberrations? So it can be classified into chromatic and monochromatic aberrations. Monochromatic aberrations occur due to the geometry of the lens curvature and the corneal curvature and the refractive indices. So the five major serial monochromatic aberrations are astigmatism, spherical aberration, coma, distortion, and field curvature. And these aberrations occur even when there is a monochromatic light. And this chromatic aberration is one that occurs because of different wavelengths of light. And each wavelength of light is refracted at a different level. So shorter wavelengths like blue color are anteriorly focused and longer wavelengths like red color are posteriorly focused. So this is the basis of our duochrome test where we use this to refine our sphere after a subjective refraction. Here, when the patient is asked to see the red and green chart with one eye occluded and the eye focused at around 618 or 6 by 12, so we ask them which chart is seen clearly for them. If the patient says they see the red, green chart more clearly, it means that the high, eye is hypermetropic and hence we need to refine the sphere by adding a plus 0.25 diopters. Whereas if the patient sees the red more clearly, it means that the eye is myopic and hence we need to add a minus 0.25 diopters in order to make the patient focus on the yellow line. So how long will you do this test? So until the patient sees both green and red on an equal range. So it indirectly means that the yellow is in focus and then the eye is emetropic. What are the types of aberrometry? So it can be objective or subjective. And among the objective, you have outgoing, ingoing, and ingoing feedback. So outgoing aberrometers measure the aberration by analyzing the uh, light as they come out of the pupil. And ingoing aberrometers measure the aberrations as the light enters the pupil and into the optical system and forms an image on the retina. So examples of each are, the subjective one is the Schinner smirnov aberrometer. In the outgoing, you have the famous hartmann shack wafered sensor. And in the ingoing types, we have the Schoening aberroscope, cross-cylinder aberroscope, and ray tracing technique. And in ingoing feedback, we have the spatially resolved refractometer. So for all practical reasons, I'll be dealing about all these three uh, aberrometers in the subsequent slides. So Sheena Smirnov aberrometer was the first developed subjective aberrometer with the famous scientists Sheena and Smirnov. They used a very simple device called as the Sheena's disc. So this is the Sheena's disc with a central hole and a peripheral hole. The central one is called as the reference hole. A fixed light source is projected to, through the central hole and a movable light source is projected through the peripheral hole. And then the patient is asked to adjust this movable light source until they're able to focus this isolated ray and intersect on the fixed light ray here in order to form a clear point retinal image. And then by measuring how much of displacement has happened in order to focus this, by measuring the delta X and delta Y, we were able to calculate the aberrations of that particular eye at that particular pupil point. And more modifications and development in this aberrometer came the most commonly used hartmann shack aberrometer. So this, as earlier we discussed, it's an outgoing aberrometer. So to start with, a low powered laser beam is focused onto the retina and this will form as a point source on the retina. Now the reflected wave wave light which is coming out of this point source crosses through the optical system of the eye 
and then through the relay lenses, and then through the Hartman screen, which consists of multiple tiny lenses, otherwise called as a lens slit array. And then it is finally focused onto a CCD video sensor. So now in an ideal perfect wave front, which has a parallel, which has parallel beam of rights. So it forms, this is a cross section of all these uh, wave lights. So you can see a perfect lattice point of images. Whereas in an aberrated wave front, you will see a distorted collection of spot images. And by measuring how much each point has displaced from this fixed point, they were able to calculate the aberrations. What is the ray tracing technology? So the famous eye trace uses this ray tracing technology, which is an ingoing aberrometer here. So the eye trace rapidly sends, it sequentially sends 256 individual parallel light beams onto the retina. And then it charts the precise points of each light beam which they have sent. And it is charted in, to form the uh, aberration to measure the aberrations. And then a powerful software uh, analysis is done in order to bring out the graphical displays. So this will be the final product. So, but before this, these aberrations have to be analyzed. So aberrations can be analyzed by, use of, by using various analysis methods. So they can be Taylor series expansion, Fourier analysis, and Zernike polynomials. Zernike polynomials are the most commonly used representation in our day-to-day -day practice. These are nothing but mathematical formulas which are uh, derived in order to represent the ocular surface aberrations. And the magnitude of these aberrations is given as root mean square, that is the RMS values, which is nothing but the square root of wavefront variance. A normal RMS of total I should be somewhere less than 0.3 microns. So now all these calculations are done at the pupillary level. So there are some measurement metrics which can be done at the retinal level as, as, as well. So one is the point spread function. So this is nothing but it explains the image that is formed on the retina out of a point source. And this is expressed as, a, as an airy disk. So this is nothing but a Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of a circular pupil. And next is the Strels ratio, which is a measure of optical excellence. And the third one is the modulation transfer function, which is nothing but a measure of reduction in contrast from the object to the image. And it is greater from zero to one, where one is full perfection. And the other metrics are phase transfer function and optical transfer function. So for more practical reasons, we'll be talking about Zernike polynomials here in this class. So the zero order and the first order aberrations are called as the constant aberrations. These are present in all optical systems and they are totally non-visually significant. So the zero order aberration is called as the piston and the first order aberration is called the tilt. It has a horizontal or a vertical tilt. It can also be called as prism. Next in the third line comes the second order aberration otherwise called the lower order aberrations. These are the aberrations which can be corrected by traditional means with a sphere and a cylinder. So this consists of a defocus, which includes both myopia and hyperopia and a vertical and a horizontal astigmatism. And all the other remaining ones here, like coma, spherical aberration, secondary astigmatism, trefoil, tetrafoil, pentafoil and hexafoil, all comes under higher order aberrations. So these are the point spread images of these aberrations. So if you see, it's important to note that all the aberrations, which is near the center of the pyramid, affects the retinal image quality more than that on the periphery of the pyramid. And none, none of the eye is totally aberration free. So all eyes are composed of various combination of aberrations and each of these combinations can result in a poorer visual quality or a better visual quality. And it all depends on the individual neural processing capabilities. So I'll be dealing about defocus spherical aberration and coma in the subsequent slides. So first to see about defocus, 
So it includes both myopia and hyperopia. A positive defocus is called myopia and a negative defocus is called hyperopia. So if you can see here, a myopia will have a paraboidal or a bald shape. All similar colors will represent all the wave lights that are in same phase. The ones in blue are the waves which are in retarded light phase or which is behind the ideal wavefront or these are the rays with longer optical path difference. Whereas the ones in red are those in advanced phase or these are the rays with shorter optical path difference. So this is a two dimensional representation of the same three dimensional image. And this will be the point spread function of a positive defocus otherwise called myopia. Spherical aberration is the most commonly occurring fourth order aberration. So as we earlier saw here, the peripheral or the marginal rays come into focus in front before the central or the paraxial rays. And here again, if you see, so the central ones are in retarded phase, whereas the peripheral light rays are in advanced phase focusing in front than the central rays. So this is a typical positive spherical aberration and a point spread function will be a typical halo around the array disc. And the common symptom in a patient with spherical aberration will be glare, halos and light myopia. And it increases after a myopic classic as we saw earlier and in dysfunctional lens syndrome. And spherical aberration may increase the depth of the field but decreases the contrast sensitivity. Coma is the third order higher, uh, higher order aberration. So here, the light rays in one edge of the pupil come into focus before the light rays from the other edge of the pupil do. So as you can see here, this is not the exact representation, a representational image. So if we see here in the three dimensional uh, image, you can see one half of the pupil has wave lights in advanced phase and the other of the half of the pupil have wave lights in a retarded phase. So that this is a two dimensional representation. So this is typical of a vertical coma and it has a typical coma sh shape in the point spread function. And most common symptom will be blur and double vision. And it is most often seen in patients with keratoconus, in decentered laser ablations, in decentered corneal grafts, in tilted IOLs and in misaligned toric IOLs. So now let's move to the third topic of our uh, uh, lecture today. So basically here I'll be dealing on the applications of eye trace in cataract surgery. So before going into it, so we need to know how to read an eye trace. So this will be the first display after you've taken a eye trace examination. So this is a wavefront verification display. We should make sure that none of the points are rejected here and all the 256 points have entered into the pupil through this. And this is an overall appearance of a point spread function. And the box on the right will show us the limbus diameter, the pupil diameter, the scan diameter, the fixation target position. And this green line shows the tracy refraction, which is a simulated auto refraction. And below this will be the multi-zonal refraction. Here in this patient, the pupil size uh, uh, is little lesser. So it gives only one zones refraction. And below this is the root mean square. The first one will be then overall total value of the aberrations. And the second one gives the LO total, which is nothing but the lower order aberrations total. These lower order aberrations will include defocus and astigmatism. And the third, you will get the higher order aberrations in total, which will include coma, spherical aberration, secondary astigmatism, and trefoil. So, Applications of eye trace. So first we'll be discussing how it helps us to improve the treatment outcomes by finding the exact origin of our patient. So scenario one, so this is a patient who has come for LASIK. So if you see here, so this is the wavefront map of the cornea, which says total and no defocus. So we usually take this scan into consideration because we don't want the wavefront map to be saturated with all the defocus. So without the defocus, that is without the myopia and hyperopia, we want to see what are the other aberrations remaining. So this is the wavefront map of the cornea, total no defocus. And this is the wavefront map of the entire eye, total no defocus. 
and this is the wavefront map of the internal optics so internal optics is nothing but it indicates the wavefront map of the lens so if you see in the cornea there is not much of color changes there is not much of aberrations but the entire uh, total aberrations in the eye has come from the internal optics so in this patient going ahead with a refractive surgery would still give us a poor outcome because the patient is going to have his internal optics and it is going to retain all these higher order aberrations so it's better to avoid refractive surgery in such kind of a patient and this is a patient who has come before the cataract surgery here again if you see this is the of the cornea this is of the internal optics the combination of this gives the entire eye so here again if you see the ones marked in red color are all the significant higher order aberrations so all the higher order aberrations are all the higher order aberrations are entirely in the cornea and that is what is reflected in the entire eye here whereas the internal optics is completely free of any aberrations so in this patient if you go ahead and plan a premium iol the patient is going to retain the corneal higher order aberrations so you might expect a poor outcome post operatively and one more thing to note is he has a high amount of astigmatism in his cornea which has to be target targeted during his cataract surgery and third scenario is the early cataract and dysfunctional lens syndrome how the eye test is going to help us so here i want to share one of my experiences so few years back i had a patient who used to work here as a volunteer so he was basically from us so he he uh, was a professional uh, photographer so he was uh, feeling that his vision is not a, was not as good as before and so he had his eye examination from various ophthalmologists uh, both in us and here in india so and he was repeatedly being advised that he was completely fine and he is over complaining and his vision is 6 by 6 and he didn't have any cataract so when we had a random chat so he was in his mid 60s so that is when we had our eye trace uh, instrument here in arvin so i wanted to see what will be his dysfunctional lens index so this is the dysfunctional lens patient display so it is an objective measure of the lens's performance so it will give you a dysfunctional lens index here so it is marked from 0 to 10 so anything which is less than 5 will indicate that the lens performance of the patient is definitely poor and it will be surprising to know that this will be less even before you have graded the opacity of the cataract in slit lamp so uh, this clearly shows the simulated snell and ease here the cornea is okay here but whereas the internal optics shows a very poor simulated snell and e resulting in an overall poor visual quality so my patient as well had a similar picture so when i showed him he was completely awestruck and was extremely happy for two main reasons one he was happy that his complaints were true then and i believed it and we were able to objectively quantify it and it is amazing to know how it increased the patient's confidence on the cataract surgeon or on us so this was a wonderful uh, feature of an eye trace to find out so even though you don't see a significant amount of cataract but the patient is having a, a, a vision problem so it is it's uh, reasonable enough to go and find out what is this functional lens index is and coming out to the next application of eye trace how to increase the premium lens success so now we use the eye trace in step 1 we go and check the amount and source of aberration so here the total aberration is around 0.938 so normal rms should be less than 0.3 microns here if you see the cornea is almost free of aberrations if you see all the letters are in white here if it is in red it means it is abnormal and these are the specific rms bar graphs which is specifically seen in this chang analysis which is formulated by the famous cataract surgeon dr david chang so it will give us the magnitude of the aberrations also so the wavefront maps which we see saw earlier is being replaced by these rms bar graphs so in this patient all of his corneal all of his higher order aberrations are arising from the internal optics 
So it is okay to proceed with the cataract. So after cataract, when you remove this internal optics, he is going to have a good vision postoperatively. One important thing to note here is the astigmatism in the cornea is blue in color. The astigmatism in the lens is red in color, and that is why the overall astigmatism it is not as big as this blue bar. It is little less. So if you go ahead and just select only for astigmatism and see where the source is, you can clearly make out that the source is completely from the cornea rather than the internal optics. So it's important for us to target this astigmatism before proceeding for a premium IUL. And also we should check how much amount of coma the patient has. So the coma should definitely be less than 0.3 microns. Step two is check for optical alignment. So this is another invaluable information which the uh, eye trace gives. So here the red cross indicates the visual axis. The green cross indicates the pupillary center and the blue cross indicates the limbal center. So angle alpha is the vertex distance between the visual axis and the limbal center. So between the red cross and the blue cross. So this is the angle alpha and the angle alpha distance is displayed here. And angle kappa is the distance between the visual axis and the pupillary center. So angle kappa distance is also given here. So how important are these angle alpha and angle kappa? So angle alpha is more important in a cataract surgery because the center of the bag, which is where you're going to place an IUL, will almost correspond to the center of the limbus. So that is why a normal angle alpha of less than 0.5 mm is very essential before you even think of implanting a premium lens. Because when you implant a monofocal lens, even a little bit of decentration is forgiving. Whereas when you go for an aspheric IUL or a multifocal IUL, or a toric IUL, even a 0.5 mm of decentration can result in major optical uh, dysfunction. How important is angle kappa? Angle kappa is more important in refractive surgeries because the la excimal laser aberrations are centered around the fixation point. And if the angle kappa is more, that is that between the pupillary axis and the visual axis, then you will have a decentered ablation, you will have an undercorrection, you will have an irregular astigmatism postoperatively. Even so, when you're planning a hyperopic ablation, if this angle kappa is more, then it might re result in a double corneal apex. So it's important to make sure that the angle kappa is less than 0.4 to 0.5 mm before proceeding with an eczema laser ablation. And step three, you have to decide on which aspheric IUL to implant. So what are the types of IUL available in market? We have a spherical IUL with a positive spherical aberration. So this we have already seen. So the peripheral rays come into focus even before the central rays. So this has the same curvature and the power increases from the center to the edges. Whereas an IUL with a zero spherical aberration has a variable curvature radii, but a constant power. So thus resulting in an exact point focus with no spherical aberration. Whereas in an aspheric IOL with a negative spherical aberration, the power decreases from the center to edge, resulting in a negative spherical aberration. So what are the commonly available IOLs? The Alcon MA6080, Sensor AR40E, CT spheres all belong to the spherical IOL. Acrios, Envista, Softport, Bosch and Lom lenses all are IOLs with zero spherical aberration. And lenses like IQ, Technus, Hoya, Fine Vision, and CT Esfina are those IULs with negative spherical aberration. So how to decide on which IUL to choose? So if you have a hyperopic classic, so remember this hyperprolate structure. So if you have a high, prior hyperopic classic patient, this patient will be having a large amount of negative spherical aberration to start with. And if you're dealing with patients with small mesopic pupils, that is even in the nighttime, their pupils are not going to be very large, then you can go with a spherical IUL itself. If there is no prior refractive surgery history, 
but there are chances of IUL disintegration, like in PXF cases, in hypermature cataracts and mature cataracts where you're not sure if you're capsular excess and the IUL centration or very high amount of myopia. So whenever you're in doubts, go with a aspheric IUL with zero spherical aberration because it's more forgiving than one with a negative spherical aberration. And if there are no chances of IUL decentration, but the depth of the field is important for the patient, then again go for an aspheric IUL with zero residual spherical aberration. If the image quality is very important for the patient, you need to go with an aspheric IUL with a negative spherical aberration. And if the patient already starts with a higher positive spherical aberration, like in a prior myopic classic, and in patients who are getting a high powered IUL, like in the ranges of plus 28, plus 29. So these IULs in itself will cause a high amount of spherical aberration. So it is important to go for a spherical, uh, an aspheric IUL with a negative spherical aberration. So uh, are we done? Is it so easy and simple to select what IUL to choose? So a residual spherical aberration, if it's positive, it will uh, give us a poor image quality and a poor contrast, but a good depth of focus. Whereas if the residual spherical aberration is zero, it will give us a good enough image quality and a good enough depth of focus. But if your residual spherical aberration is negative, the image quality and contrast is really good, but with a lesser depth of focus. But one thing to remember, so this is one of my previous slides. So the natural cornea had a slight positive spherical aberration. So, when we are going to take this lens out, which was compensating for this positive spherical aberration, we will go with an IUL with a negative spherical aberration. So that was the funda with all this hype on aspheric IULs with negative spherical aberration. So that finally we leave a slight positive spherical aberration. But the hitch is not all patients will have a plus 0.28 microns spherical aberration. It can range from plus 0.28 to plus 0.8. So it can range in a varied amounts. So it is important for us to know what is the preoperative corneal spherical ablation. And that is where the eye trace comes for rescue. And it exactly tells us what the preoperative corneal spherical aberration is at the 6 mm zone. And for this patient, it is 0.33. And the key point to remember is the tolerance to defocus was significantly higher with spherical IULs than with aspheric IULs. So as you can see in this picture, when you have placed a spherical IUL, even if your post-operative residual refractive error is minus 0.5, or if it is plus 0.5, the patient was happy and satisfied because the tolerance to defocus is better in a spherical IUL. Whereas the tolerance defocus is very poor in a patient with a negative spherical aberration IUL. So you have to go for a zero diopter target postoperatively. So you have to go for a perfection. So otherwise you're not going to get your refractive success. So it is better to leave a patient with astigmatism than to leave a patient with spherical aberration because it's better to nail the lower order aberrations first, concentrate on a defocus and your astigmatism first and then go for a a spherical aberration correction because when you're going with an aspheric IUL, so you have a very low margin of error. And also the advantages of asphericity are lost when IUL decentration is greater than 0.5 mm. So in this era where everybody is hyped with using a spherical aspheric IUL, it is important for us to know what are all the disadvantages with an aspheric IUL. So if you're not going to target on the right dot, we are going to have a lot of postoperative refractive surprises. So, and then the maximum image quality depends on an interaction between the residual SA, the residual spherical aberration, and the defocus. For example, so this is a recommended strategy here. So, we measure the pre ops corneal spherical aberration at 6 mm, and we plan your aspheric IUL and calculate the residual SA. So, if the residual spherical aberration is going to be zero, you can target a plano refraction. But if it, the residual spherical aberration is negative, you better target for a plus 0.25 diopters for each 0.10 microns change in your essay. And if your residual spherical aberration is positive, 
you better target slightly myopic, a minus 0.25 diopters for each 0 0.10 microns. So for example, for this patient, so the corneal spherical aberration is 0 0.33. So if you're going to implant an acris of IQ lens with a negative spherical aberration of 0 0.20, you will be leading, read, uh, leaving a residual spherical aberration postoperatively of 0 0.13. So this is somewhat nearer to the natural SA which we retain. But whereas if you keep a uh, lens like Acrios and Invista with zero SA to start with, you will be leading, leaving a complete corneal spherical aberration of plus 0.33 in the post-operative refraction. So in this case, it is better to target a slight myopia of minus 0.25 diopters in your post-operative refractive target. So and third comes how you can use the eye trace for planning the toric IOL and toric IOL check. So for planning the toric IOL, so as we already saw how we were able to identify the exact source of astigmatism. And this is another useful display called as a toric al alignment check. So this gives us exactly, even without dilating the pupil, it will tell us what is the IOL's steep uh, cylinder power in which axis it is and the cornea's steep axis and it will also give us a recommendation on how much of degree the IOL has to be rotated and what will be the change in cylinder power and what will be the predicted post rotation refraction. And the other box on the left side in the lower region, it will give us the current corneal power and the toric lens power. And it's important to note that both should have equal powers. If it is not matching, it means to start with you have implanted a wrong toric lens power. So only when this is matching, then you can proceed with the rotation. So another key point to remember when planning toric IOLs. So most of our traditional keratometers measure only the anterior corneal curvature. So there's something more important. So something called the posterior corneal astigmatism. So posterior cornea can be considered as a vertically steep minus lens. So hence it will induce a plus power at 180. So you can ask me, vertically steep lens will induce a plus at 90. But since it is a minus lens, it is inducing a plus at 180. So if patient has a with the rule astigmatism to start with, so with the rule astigmatism is nothing but plus at 90. So if the patient has with the rule astigmatism, this posterior cornea will compensate for this plus at 90. And as a result, will give us a less overall astigmatism. Whereas if the patient has an against the rule astigmatism that is plus at 180, this posterior corneal astigmatism is going to add on to this against the rule astigmatism resulting in a more overall astigmatism. And this is the basis of using a toric IOL. You will have a very low threshold of using a toric IOL in an against the rule astigmatism when compared to the with the rule astigmatism. So if it is an against the rule astigmatism, even when it is more than one, you want to use a toric IOL. Whereas in a WRA, so you wait until it becomes 1.5. So the next application is to identify the cause of post-operative dis dissatisfaction. So this is a patient uh, uh, post premium IOL surgery. So as it is clearly indicated here, the cornea is completely fine, but all these red bars are completely because of the internal optics. So, and you can see the comas are high here. So this indicates uh, that the patient has a tilted IOL. And there's one other beautiful uh, display here, the visual function analysis display, which gives us a comprehensive summary of a side-by-side -side display of both the eyes together. And this is usually uh, done in a heterototal mode. That is, we don't want the lower order aberrations like defocus because we will be able to correct them with, uh, with the spheres and the cylinders. We just want to see the residual higher order aberrations remaining after our refractive or a cataract surgery. So now if you can see in the entrance pupil range, there are more blue colors, almost a minus two diopters of refractive change. So this is significant here. And below that you can see, uh, this is a simulated tracy refraction and this is a multi-zone refraction. If you see more clearly, the multi, in the multi-zone refraction, there is almost a one diopter change in spherical power as the pupil size increases. So this is a short, short sign of night myopia. And below that, you can see the RMS, the root mean square total of around 
12.239. So this, and here you see the point spread function, and here you see the simulated Schnellen E, what the patient will see after your complete sphere and cylindrical correction. So this is the higher order aberrations which are completely remaining. And this below that you will see the potential visual complaints of the patient. So this, the previous one, so this was a scan which is taken at 7.5 mm dilatation of pupil. So the at 7.5 mm pupil dilatation patient was having this much of aberration. But when the pupil is small to around 2 mm, he's able to see completely clear. So this is very typical of a positive spherical aberration. So now the last application is objectively, it can measure accommodation. So this is very unique of eye trace. So it will, by comparing the amount of change of spherical power, when the patient is fixing from distance or from near to far, so you can find out what is the accommodation amplitude in that patient. Even in pseudofakes, it can be used. So now I'll be touching on some of, uh, uh, applications of wavefront aberrometry in LASIK. So in a post-conventional myopic LASIK, as you can see here, we've already discussed, we make the cornea a little oblate flat in the center. So in daylight situations, all the light rays would be passing through the ablated region. So the patient will be completely happy. But in the night uh, time, when the pupil is dilated in mesopic conditions, the light rays will be falling on these corners or the transition zones where it is very sharp. And this will lead to the spherical abrasions. So this is the disadvantage of a conventional myopic LASIK. Whereas in a wavefront optimized LASIK, what do we do here? So we'll try to maintain the corneal aspherosity. In other terms, we'll try to maintain the uniform curvature of the cornea from center until the edge. And we'll try to smoothen the blend zone or the transition zone. We'll taper the corners to correct the distortions. So this is the advantage of a wavefront optimized LASIK. Important point to notice, it will not take the patient's preoperative higher order aberration for corrections. So it will only maintain the corneal aspherosity and it smoothens the blend zone. So what is then the wavefront guided or a customized LASIK? So this is the one which will measure the preoperative higher order aberrations of the patient completely by using a wavefront abrometer. So most often we use a Hartman Shack wavefront sensor to measure these higher order abrasions and these uh, higher order abrasion correction is also included in the treatment program and by the pupil tracking mechanism you'll try to uh, nail all the lower order as well as the higher order abrasions thereby giving uh, superior vision quality so that is the advantage of a wavefront guided or a customized LASIK so it will be unfair for me to uh, close the session without discussing on uh, aura or the intraoperative aberrometry. So this is the latest addition into uh, cataract surgeon's uh, uh, kitty. So here uh, it uses a novel form of wave light uh, sensing, the talboic moir interferometry. And it is a very light and compact uh, instrument which can be, which is directly attachable to the surgical microscope. And uh, so why it is done uh, to improve the uh, biometric calculations and its precisions. So once the cataract is removed, the eye is filled with little amount of visco and this aura is used to calculate the exact amount of uh, uh, IOL power uh, in the aphakic mode. So, and studies have found that it, is, it gives us uh, better uh, uh, post-operative refractive outcomes uh, than the uh, other biometric uh, calculations and more for uh, more uh, useful for uh, the uh, toric alignments and the degree. So these are my references. Thank you.
Um, and you're not able to hear your voice. So I don't have much idea about the Schwinn the topographer. So I can see a question by Dr. Jogi Agarwal. Can you explain schematic listers and donders reduced dye concepts? Um, so there are certain questions which are asked, uh, which I'm not very clear, and I don't want to give some uh, aberrated answers. So we'll have a proper preparation on all those things, and we can have a good class on that as well. So this lecture is available on uh, OroTube as well. So um, for uh, questions, you can post in the OroTube sites and uh, I'll try to answer them. Okay, everyone. Um, so, okay, there was one question where Aditi asked, did not understand the concept of having uh, cornea having positive spherical abrasion where Q value is slight negative. So, Q value uh, talks about corneal asphericity and uh, both are related but not the same. So if you go back and listen to the lecture, you'll be able to find the answer for it. Uh, Asphericity, because it is slightly prolate. And uh, as, this was one question which was uh, bothering me as well. And, uh, and I tried to study more, uh, more on that. And I found out that uh, more oblate and less prolate corneas, less prolate structures will tend to have a positive corneal spherical abrasion. And that is why a cornea goes into a positive corneal elaboration mode. Okay, so we'll wind up the class for today. Uh, for any more questions, uh, which I if, I, if I'm able to answer, I'll answer in the order too. Please uh, upload your questions there. Thank you once again. Yeah, bye.